building the modern GIS web stack. So we'll talk about that, and we're here at Tartu. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. So my name is Jashan Preet Singh, but I do go by Jason Singh. My, also, my website is jasonsingh.com, uh, because at the start of my career, Jason is what I was doing. Like, I would keep on going to my colleagues, Jason this, Jason that, and they would like send the Jason in this format. I'm a freelancer based out of India. Um, I've done a lot of full stack development. I started off with building front ends, then I moved to back ends, and then databases and cloud. Uh, on the right are my two colleagues that I work with. Uh, they are cats. Uh, one is Neko, one is Kato. Both of them are actually named cats. Neko is cat in Japanese, and Kato is cat in Spanish. So, fun bit. OK, defining the problem statement itself, what exactly are going to be, we are going to be talking about. Let me put a timer also. OK, so what exactly are going to be talking about? So building the GIS data management system. So as a freelancer and also like a web developer before coming into the GIS system, almost every system can be generalized into building a data management system which is essentially like you have some data, either it's user generated or some, something else generated and users are interacting with that data, right? When you, end, uh, when you add the GIS part, uh, the only thing that it changes is now there is a spatial component to it. But again, that's like a huge property of a GIS management system. system. But a lot of the concepts of data management systems also plays a part while you're working with GIS data. It's not separate. Both the industries come in together while uh, from the GIS side and from a standard CMS or data management side. So the problem statement, uh, what like what I'm gonna be talking about is building such how to build such a system. What are the different concepts involved? How you can tackle them and like give a sort of a template on how you can go about it. The uh, I mean of course, and this is like a generalized way of going about it and. Like, it's not going to cover every use case. So the idea is just to cover a wide variety of use cases. It's fast to build and easy to manage, right? So any uh, uh, system has, like, uh, these different parts. There is front end, where the users see and interact with the data. There's a back end, where you process the data. There's a database, where you store the data and cloud, which is essentially running it on someone else's computer, or more appropriately, putting it on the internet. So. That's what uh, these are the different components that we're going to be talking about, right? Right. So these are the different uh, topics that we'll go through. What is modern? Why Python? Why fast API? What's going to be the front end? Where it's going to be hosted? What's the database? What about the cloud? All these different aspects of uh, building a uh, GIS data management system, right? So what exactly is modern? I mean, it's, it's very hard to define what is modern. It's very subjective. It's very context specific. For somebody, modern could be very much going from uh, old service to a new service, but that service might still be old. But modern in, uh, modern in today's world and how I would define it, that you build it for the web. You build it so that it's built for accessibility, it's easier to access, it's interoperable and everybody is able to work with that data. So the focus of this talk is to make it more web-oriented and have some cloud-native support and use like the modern tooling that is available to work with that data. Right? So the stack uh, that I propose, or the stack that I've worked, uh, that stack that I've also gone through while working with a lot of GIS data management system, like all the different uh, projects that came to me, this is like the most generic or the most uh, common stack that I've worked with and also found it to be like able to solve majority of these problems. The back end is uh, Python plus FastAPI. FastAPI is relatively new. Uh, front end is in React plus MapLibre. React is old but still like changing every time and MapLibre is relatively new. Database is Postgres, PostGIS. Even though PostGIS is not new, it has been able to tackle any sort of problems that you can deal uh, that you can that you need to deal with in your GIS database or GIS uh, data sets and cloud uh, in today's world we can run on any cloud uh, we don't need to stick to one cloud stick to their services so for the cloud it's just basically any any uh, I've not faced any issues while migrating from one cloud to the another uh, it, it has been very easy that way so let's talk about the front end. So for front end, a lot of, uh, as a freelancer, I've approached by clients, and a lot of the times they are heavily focused on the front end. 
like they don't generally never even talk about uh, what's going to go into the back end it's majorly front end like the front end has to look good it has to look smooth and uh, this is also one of the first things that they talk about okay, we need the front end to be ready we need the front end poc to be ready we don't care about what goes into the back end right so for front end uh, i mean you have a lot of options react is just one of them i found it to be highly versatile it can cover a lot of use cases and again this is not react doesn't have anything to do with gis right this has all to do with uh, building a ui building a better ui a smooth ui ux and it's still one of the most popular front end libraries i mean others are getting there but still even if you are if you are going out hiring for talent you will still find there are more react developers right and there's a huge component support like depending on what design system you choose you'll find a lot of compatibility with react ecosystem right so that's about the core uh, react component the map engine the gis part now that is i've chosen to be i've chosen it to be a map libre it's a growing community and gets everything done by that i mean mostly i mean not everything everything if you're still looking for a very high level of uh, 3d support you still have to go to cesium and the alternatives like that are listed down mapbox and leaflet leaflet is still a very great library for doing a lot of stuff but again it doesn't support it doesn't have webgl support so if you are go, if you if you're going to work with a lot of heavy uh, or like if you with a lot of data and you care about performance then you have to stick to something that supports webgl so map libre will be there and open layers Open layers is actually quite well. Uh, there's also a stack support for open layer, and Map Libre doesn't support stack uh, out of the box as of now. So you know, it depends on your use case. If you have like a stack data sets and you want to get things done and you want to visualize a cog, uh, so open layers would be your choice. And then additionally, uh, there's also DeckGL. It's not part of the Map Engine, but you can also use it to to load a very huge amount of data in a very uh, in a relatively much less seconds it offloads all of your uh, rendering and all of your data processing to the gpu uh, my colleague here uh, shrijit gave a good workshop on it so if you don't know right uh, so moving on to the back end so the back end the choice was uh, quite i mean it's usually very simple there is uh, there's always a python packages there's always a python package that can get the stuff done you need to do with the geospatial data so it made sense to have python as a backend a lot of uh, a lot of times uh, i've met a lot of people and i've talked to a lot of people a lot of people are doing just uh, python scripting in qgis so python is the language of choice for a lot of people who are working with the geospatial data right so python that's it but on top of that there is also like it's easy to use i mean it it's very intuitive as a language and there's a huge community around supporting and adding uh, more functionalities to the geospatial side of python now fast api uh, i haven't haven't mentioned i haven't heard it uh, talking people a lot about fast api it's it's relatively new but it's it's not that new uh, initially you, uh, when when you're working with python on the web you had more, uh, more or less two choices either it's flask or django now flask it was too bare bone for you to get anything done but django brought in a lot of concepts of their own on how the data should be structured it worked uh, django was initially built for a uh, journal website or journal company to build a lot of a lot of blogs and work with a lot of blogs it does have a lot of uh, it does have support for uh, geospatial functionalities and geospatial data but it also forces you to think in a django way fast api brings in like a good balance between the two you don't you're not bare bone like flask and you're not overly uh, uh, overwhelmed by the django concepts so it's something in the middle and it really helps you get you uh, uh, get you an environment to start working uh, on the api part and not focus too much on the web part like a lot of it is handled by fast api and you just focus a lot on working with your data right so uh, we'll get into a little bit detail of that and finally the database right so you the users can see uh, you have figured out where the users how the users are going to see the data interact with the data where you're going to process the data not talk about storing the data itself now post gis even though nothing new but has been able to handle almost 
anything and everything I've thrown at it. And it's still in active development and the number of extensions keep on growing. I didn't even knew something like mobility DB existed till somebody came to me with a project for uh, building a taxi analytics app and it just works like a lot of lot of geospatial data and you can do in postgres and you don't need anything beyond it right and for raster data sets i mean for rasters uh, suppose yes uh, it's, yeah i mean you can but still it's not very recommended way of storing your rasters and working with the rasters for so for that object storage is still the best choice just put it on a bucket s3 bucket gcp bucket linode bucket it doesn't matter make it make them cogs and even for even if you have static vector uh, vector files, you can use PM tiles, and you have like built-in cloud native supports, and you don't even need a server to get uh, the data displayed on the front end. So that's what I've been working with, and there's also like very amazing library Uber H3. I uh, last uh, Phosphor G I had a talk about how you can model your data in H3 indexes and use uh, faster shape uh, spatial joins. For, for building very high performance spatial analytics. And there's also a, a extension for stack, PG stack. So the cloud. For cloud, I mean, there is really no good or bad. It will usually, it, it, it has usually come to an organization. Some organizations have affinity for AWS, some for Azure, or some for on-prem also. It, it, it's, really, it's really very open-ended and never seen like, um, Prop, uh, a, a for sure affinity, but I've all, uh, but every but Docker makes it really easy for packaging your backend applications. If you have Docker, and in in the previous talks and uh, conversations, I've also heard a lot of people using Kubernetes for working with the geospatial applications and clusters. So Docker is just in like an entry point into that whole ecosystem of cluster cluster management and all of that. So package your application as Docker, and you'll, you'll never have to worry about which cloud you're running in. For Postgres, you can run it in a VM or just also use a Docker instance, right? And as a service, it all works, but it gets really expensive really fast with the amount of data that you have to do. Uh, and especially in context of geospatial data, the data grows pretty fast. So I've seen databases for up to 2 TB, 3 TB, 4 TB, and for uh, storage like that, you have to pay a lot of money to your service provider. So it's better to run it in a VM or have your own cluster management. Static storage for front end, that's just like if, uh, so this is a more of a concept of whether you're going to be running your front end in a server side components or whether you're going to be running it on the cloud. I would recommend that you run it on a cl uh, client side because anyway, you won't be able to do any of the map stuff on the server. The map, the canvas element will still load on the client side. So a lot of the performance hit is going to be that. So there is no point of running it on the server. Just use a static storage. You will have better um, cache control, and the website will be quite fast. And any S3 compatible storage for your cogs and for your tips and any of the raster data sets that you have, even the pre-rendered tiles, that will work. right? But again, this is uh, not just something uh, that you can do. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Uh, given all of this stack, it still doesn't make sense sometimes to not use it and sometimes use part of the applications not built in this. I found GeoServer to be a great for all your backend stuff. Like it can connect to your PostGIS, it can connect to your static server, and if you just want a data uh, backend to just uh, to just load the data and you are focused more on the front end, then you can just use GeoServer on the backend. Teria.js is kind of new. I've not heard a lot of people talking about it. It's also from the Oceana side of the world. So it's also, if you have a lot of cesium, if you have a lot of uh, 3D data that you're working with, so Teria.js is great to begin with. Don't directly jump onto cesium. It's very difficult to work with, unless until you like, like absolutely a lot of challenges. So Teria.js is good to work with if you have like a lot of uh, 3D support. Mapstore and Apache Sedona are still, uh, I haven't worked with them, but I've heard like good things about like how people are using it. So these are uh, just mentioning alternative stacks. Uh, if we have some time, uh, so, I mean, enough talk, where's the code? So I've been building a GIS template for, as a beginner for people to, you know, get started with the whole GIS 
full stack application, it's still a work in progress. I've just done bare bone uh, front end stuff. I'm working on the back end. And I have listed down a couple of features. So feel free to create issues. If you can contribute, great. But if you can't, just send some feedback. That will be great. Um, so deeper into the code, I was, uh, this, this section, I put it only if I have some time left. And since we have some time left, so we're going to go over this. So deeper into the code, uh, front end. The core part, as I, uh, as I said, was React. For components, I mean, there's a huge number of libraries. If you want to support like material style, then there is material, uh, but I would recommend Shad CN. It's a very, very great library for uh, building a lot of stack. Sorry. Yeah. For building your components, and you can only pick uh, the components that you need and not the entire thing. For stylings, even if you have heard bad things about Tailwind, Tailwind it's pretty good. Uh, you don't have to worry. And also, like this, what, why I'm saying all of this is that a lot of people here are just more focused on JS and not the web aspect. So I'm simplifying a lot of these things. Key, use Tailwind, and you will don't have to worry about a lot of CSS stuff. Ma uh, for Map Engine, it's Map Libre. It's a growing community. If you put it on the Slack channel, somebody will help you with all the stuff that you need. For state management in React, you can use Jotai. For API client, you can use just basic fetch. And uh, for API cache, you can use React Query. Now, this last point, it's very important. If you have a lot of GIS data and you're making a lot of requests to the uh, back end, don't DDoS your own back end. Right? Don't keep on sending the same request and getting the same data from the back end. So it's really, really important that you have some sort of cache mechanism on your front end. It will make your website really smooth. And it will make it like, and people and users will have a lot of, I mean, users will have a good time interacting with it. Fetch your request, uh, sorry, cache your request, fetch your request, and then cache your request, and don't invalidate that cache till it's till it should be. Right. For the backend, uh, going deeper into like what the backends would uh, consist of. So the uh, so the core is again Python and uh, Fast API. Models is pedantic. Pydantic is used to uh, declare what the response and the request is going to be look like. This is really important for uh, people working in large teams. And if you have, if you want to have a common understanding of what the API will look like, database migrations is alembic. So, if you have a database and a lot of people are working on it, or even if it's just like two developers working on it, you have to have to create a version control system of your database, how it expands, how it grows. So Alembic is uh, where you write your migrations and you run the migration and see that everything is intact, right? So package it in Docker. Use ORM. I would highly recommend that you use ORM and not write your SQL right off the bat. Uh, but uh, if you're feeling risky, then sure. For GIS libraries, uh, there is also Rasterio and GDAL. I'm sure a lot of people have used it already for their Python scripts. Deeper into the code, cloud. So. Similar concepts apply on the back on the cloud itself. If you are writing your code and you're version maintaining your control, it makes sense to version control your cloud as well. So for that, uh, one of the two popular tools are Terraform and Ansible. But if you are in a specific cloud, for example, AWS, then they have CloudFormation templates for working with versions of services. So you can also use that. Azure has ADMs. And, uh, on the cloud, use COGS and PM tiles as much as possible. I mean, those are great formats. Reduce your uh, reduce your data fetches by a lot. You can you only get the data that you want. And Postgres, as I said, you can run it in Docker and VM. But if you are if you are working with a lot of data and you need to have a cluster management system, there is a great uh, tool by Crunchybridge called Postgres Operator. There's all the same by Percona and all of that. So you can run it in Kubernetes the whole uh, Postgres cluster and shift the processing on the main instance and just do the reads from the secondary instance. OK, so focusing on the key takeaways, there is no silver bullet. Obviously, this is just a very opinionated take on what your full stack would look like. right? And, but you can always bet on Python and PostGIS to handle everything that you need. Focus on the features that you want. It should be faster to build and easier to manage. And you have to have some cloud native support built into it for better performance and lower cloud costs. Right? And thank you. And that's me. Thank you, Jason. So we have time for a few questions. 
Please raise your hand and wait for the microphone as usual. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Actually, I use also this l quite similar uh, stack for my own also project, but uh, how you suggest the stack deals with the, not only rendering the data from databases, but when you need to put the data from the client side to the database, did you use some tools like, or just from the fast API you built uh, like custom API to update the data from client side when they are editing data or something like that? Uh, are you talking about like when customers build polygons and they yeah. polygons or if your customer is loading a TIFF and then you upload that TIFF onto the server, mm -hmm. stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, currently it's very custom. Mm -hmm. But uh, to work with a lot of stack and cogs and also a lot of vectors in your data, there are very two good very libraries, T Tyler and Tip PG. And those Either you can run them as an independent instance. I did mention it in the slides. But either you can run them in the independent instance or integrate them into the fast API and use those APIs and whatever APIs you want. You don't have to like bring in the whole ecosystem also. Okay. So. Because I also building like custom way and always thinking about maybe I'm <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> no, you know. This. Maybe <laughs> uh, you know uh, you should follow the T Tyler and Tip G example. Look at their code and maybe build a library for fast API that people can directly integrate into loading the geospatial data. So that would be a great way to give back to the community. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you said that cesium was a tough thing to start with. And I was wondering, does MapLibra have any 3D capability or just some primitive stuff? Or? Some 3D. They, uh, to phrase a MapLibra, they call it 2.5D. You have the hill shade and terrain stuff. So you can visualize some of it. But if you're working with a lot of 3D data, like building data, like LOD 1, 2, level 3, like up to 4, you won't be able to do that in MapLibra. And uh, MapLibre community is also looking for people to you know, build that support. So if, if you're really interested, you can go and create a PR and have that much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What uh, map engines do you suggest for 3D? CVM. Only. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, uh, there is really no better alternative. I have, yeah, uh, the, the, the library that I mentioned, Terria.js, so they, it abstracts a lot of the Cesium stuff for you to, so that you don't have to directly integrate, uh, you don't have to directly work with Cesium and you can do a lot of that stuff. Uh, but really, yeah, Cesium is the only way. Fortunately, sorry, unfortunately. More questions? Um, I'm curious to hear your view on a number of things that are not here, like full text search, elastic search, solar, these type of things, uh, and maybe Graphile uh, as an API. Uh, like, so I worked with GraphQL, uh, but still, like, in a lot of geospatial context, it's still like a lot of data is just happening on the REST API side of things. I mean, it's, it, again, it's very, so this was supposed to be a very generic and easy to do. For, if, you introdu if I introduce your GraphQL concept, then you have to understand what GraphQL is. You have to manage it on the front end and on the back end. Since a lot of uh, technologies, like even Stack, they have a REST API client. So a lot of this industry stand in, inside GIS industry is still like on the REST side. So it's, I'm still kept it like you stick to REST for now and then maybe if you want to, you can use build a GraphQL client as well. And regarding open uh, search and Elasticsearch and Kibana and all this stuff, it again goes into kind of high level stuff when you, when you have like a built in, when you have the entire system and you want to understand different patterns, what people are doing, what people are not doing, how they are interacting with the data, how the data is being stored, managed, and what's the performance metric. So it's, it's slightly high level. We have time for one last quick question. This is quite a broad topic. Uh, you, you are always tired as me, I guess. 
So let's close the session here. Let me start by thanking Jason and the other speakers. Thank the volunteers, especially Io. And thank also the technical team, which I think it's only one, pe one person, but this is all go going very smoothly, so thank you. And thank you to the audience for being here and interacting with the speakers. So enjoy your evening.